today because my baby sister is buried here. I say baby sister but she's actually older than me. My mother lost two babies before I was born and that's part of the story of how I came to Islam. Because my mom wanted to have a child so much, even though she'd gone through such loss, such heartache, such hardship, she prayed for a baby. She also asked some Muslims who happened to be from her ethnic background, Croatian Muslims who are on their way to Hajj if she could have a baby. She said, please pray for me. I really want to have a baby. And so this is the start of my story because although it started out of hardship, prayer came into it and a baby was born. I was born in the second week of Ramadan in Beirut, Lebanon. I was born in a place where the Adhan was called. I was born in a place where I heard Arabic every day. And even as a child, I would do dhikr. When I was a small child, we had a coffee grinder that was on the ground. And it has the long wooden handle. And I would beat it into the coffee grinder and I'd say, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, as a little child. So my life started surrounded by Islam. My life started because of the prayers of Muslims. And my life started out of hardship, but into happiness and joy for my parents. So I was an only child because after my parents had me, they were happy and satisfied and they didn't want to try again. And so I grew up overseas mostly and having the opportunity to learn different languages, having the opportunity to see different cultures, different lifestyles, and really having the opportunity to be around a lot of adults actually. So I kind of grew up as a, maybe a little bit of a mature child, a little bit more serious than my peers. So around the age of 14, 15, I started wanting to know God more. And one of the impetuses for that um, desire, desire to get closer to God, desire to know God, was that I had seen a video back home at my mother's parish in her hometown of Lackawanna, New York, near Buffalo. In that video, I saw six young people who were having visions of Mary and I was very touched by this video. I felt it was serious. I felt her message was sincere and I felt called to answer her request. And this is what she was asking of people. She was saying, seek God, try to get close to God, pray often, remember her son and pray for peace for the world and pray for the world to wake up to the awareness of God. These were her messages. And when I first heard these messages, they were very general, they were very broad, they could apply to anybody, anywhere. But something else is so important about this exposure to this event. Clearly from the beginning of this experience, I believe that the unseen is real and that the unseen can communicate with us. That it's not fictitious, that it's not a fantasy, that the material world is not all there is. So from the beginning I realized that this is the truth. There is a reality beyond our physical world and I can hear them calling me and I wanted to respond. And so that's what started me on my path to seeking proximity to God, to seek closeness to God, to find out who God really was. I really wanted to know who's God and what is his message and what does he have for us. And that's what started me on my journey. My mother and father are both from New York State and they incidentally met in Bonn, Germany because my father was working for the American Embassy in Germany and my mother had just moved there to begin working as well and they met one another and shortly after that they got married. So my mom worked primarily as a secretary in the State Department or overseas in the embassies for a period of time until she started trying to have a family and my father was a communications officer with the embassy. So. I grew up, again, all over the world with opportunities to see Beirut, Lebanon, opportunities to see Paris, 
Rome, Philippines, Manila, Philippines. So we always had the opportunity to, to be around other cultures, other languages, and so on. My mom and dad personally were very decent people. They, they weren't uh, people who were interested in foolish things. They weren't excessively interested in parties or socializing. They weren't big drinkers at all. In fact, I rarely ever saw them have alcohol. So they're very down-to-earth people. They're very sincere, very hardworking, very strong. Um, emotionally, they're, they're very balanced people. And so I grew up in a very stable, happy, healthy environment with a lot of opportunities for learning, lots of opportunities for cultural experiences. My mom was very committed to giving me the opportunity to see things that she didn't have a chance to see as a child. So we would often go to the theater. We would often um, travel to different places. She loved to take me to enjoy the cuisine of different countries and different places. So we always were out and about and, and just experiencing life. My father is a, a very gentle person, very even-tempered, hardly ever um, lost his temper. I mean, I could probably remember once when I was a child. So I was around very healthy, balanced people, and I think that is part of why I've been able to do what I what I have done in my life and to become who I am. Another thing that they they did for me, my father was the one who used to take me to the library, take me to the parks, take me out um, to the museums. So we were always able to to do family activities, to to be enriched. Every, every opportunity there was, we took advantage of it. And my dad was also a very creative person. He's an artist. He draws, he paints, and so was his father, a very talented artist. And he was actually also um, very um, artistic in the, uh, in, on the sta in the stage and also in singing, although that kind of dwindled over the years, but that's something he really enjoyed. So he's a very expressive person. So he would often tell me stories and read books to me. But I would always say to him, Dad, I want you to tell me the story from your mouth. Because he would make up a story and it would be so much more rich and so beautiful and, and we'd have all those opportunities to be together. So every time I think of the library when I was little, I always see him. And he's the one who would take me there and read books to me and we'd get books and so on. So it was a healthy childhood, balanced childhood. And one of the other things my parents really pushed me to do was work hard at school. They wanted me to achieve, they wanted me to excel, and whenever I'd come home with mediocre grades as a, even a young elementary school child, they would say, this is not good enough, you can do better. You can be better, you can do more, and they would push me. If my handwriting was sloppy, my father said, you can do better, this is not good enough, you can do better, I know it, you have it within you. So they always would say, you are capable of more, you are capable of understanding, you are capable of doing better, producing better, and so on. So I've always been a serious student because of their encouragement. And I think that's also a really big theme in my life in terms of my interest in Islam and my interest in studying because as a Muslim I have never stopped learning. I always want to know, I always want to know why, I want to know what, I want to know how, I want to know the meaning of this religion. I didn't pick it for convenience sake, I didn't pick it to follow along with someone else, I didn't pick it because anyone forced me to. I wanted to know this and because of this drive to learn and drive to achieve that my parents instilled in me, I continue that in my life as a Muslim. And I do that for my children as well, whom I homeschool. So after I'd seen this video about the miracles at Medjugorje, I really took it very seriously and I started going back to the Catholic Church. And I started going to confession and attending Mass. And even my mom wasn't that interested at the time, so it was myself. Uh, I, I went by myself, basically. And I would go and I'd be waiting to know about God and waiting and waiting and I, my answers were not being, or my questions rather were not being answered. My knowledge wasn't growing and my desire to have that proximity to God, it wasn't happening. So I decided to look elsewhere. I said, well, this isn't it. And interestingly at the time, the New Age movement, as was so-called New Age movement, was growing, where basically people were looking at the spiritual nature of life, looking at how can one find a path to God outside of dogma, outside of religious traditions that might have gone astray, 
Because there's many people out there who are unhappy with traditions that have become dry, dead, meaningless, or dogmatic, or the pressure to conform. You know, people are, in many places around the world, are, are, are seeking something better. And so I began to read in the genre of the New Age movement, or what's also called the metaphysical movement. And basically, what were the ideas that I learned? Well, that God is ever-present and that you can connect with God. Well, there's my first answer of what I've been seeking. That's what I wanted to know. I wanted to know that God is ever-present and available to me and that I can connect with Him. My answer was, was uh, received. So then what else did I learn? And interestingly, I met a family where the mother and father were very much into meditation. And I saw in this family a peace and a tranquility and a balance that I hadn't observed before and I hadn't felt before. And I was very impressed by their character and I was very impressed by the potential to develop that in myself. So I looked into a church that was in my area and it was called Arlington Metaphysical Chapel in Arlington, Virginia. And it just so happened that they had many of the things I was looking for. The message that they had was that God is ever-present. In fact, the reverend who led the church used to say, God, 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 there is not else but God. La ilaha illallah, basically. So I was, I was down with that. I liked that. I was like, yes, God, 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 there's not else but God. Yes. All right, what was the next thing I learned? That you can have this connection, that you don't need an intermediary, that you can ask God to come towards you. You can plead towards God and ask for help and assistance. Another big message was that life is a test and the experiences you have in this world are meant for your growth, whether they're challenging or whether they're not challenging, that they're all part of your lesson and you should be approaching each of these events in your life as someone who is on a journey to grow and to change. And this was a strong theme. So every week that I would go to this church, they would emphasize this in every sermon, looking at your challenges in life, looking at their shortcomings, and trying to connect with God and understand the message of what He's giving you in your life. So essentially that was like what I learned in Islam, which is trying to follow the will of Allah and understanding how it's playing out in your life. So that was a strong theme. Another theme that I learned there was when it came to the time to accept the um, donations, we would take them up to the altar and we'd say a verse, or we'd sing it actually, but we'd say, we give thee but thine own, whatever the gift may be, all that we have is thine alone. Ah, trust, O Lord, in thee. Very Islamic message too. So I say to people that this place, although it's a different environment, it's technically a somewhat Christian environment, although they looked at the scriptures of many religions and brought it into the, to the services. It was a training for me in Islamic thinking and in Islamic principles because these ideas are definitely some of the big ideas in Islam as well. And I think it was preparing me for this transition. And it was answering those questions that I had. What is God all about? What is the purpose of life? What am I supposed to do with myself? And can I connect with God? Can I understand that the unseen world has an impact on me and how can I relate to it? Another thing that I learned there and that really I was attuned to because having grown up Catholic, I actually never realized, believe it or not, that they believed Jesus was God. It never even occurred to me that a human being could be God. So I never believed that. And one time, before I had encountered this other church, I was standing in a Catholic mass and the preacher said, and the priest rather says, and Jesus is God. What? <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I said, did I just hear him correctly? So clearly from the beginning, it was never in me, this, this notion. I never had to correct that idea because that idea was never in me that that was possible. It never made sense. And in this particular church that I did find, they never taught that Jesus was God. In fact, they taught that he was what they called a master teacher, someone whom you would use as a guide to God. And that is how I looked at him. So I was very comfortable with that. Another thing that was common in this church is that we would, um, we would get what we called 
psychic messages or spiritual messages from the reverend or whomever was conducting the service. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't listen to everybody. There was only one person in particular who was really, really pure and really good. His messages were always very positive. And you knew sincerely he wasn't bluffing, he wasn't pretending, he wasn't a charlatan. Really pure-hearted individual. And he was actually the person uh, who I would go see at the most. I would attend his services the most often. And the thing that he did that I loved so much, besides these messages, which I thought were pretty exciting. Oh, wow, spiritual world's communicating with you. Yay, isn't that exciting? But the thing that he would emphasize, and a couple of the other uh, reverends would emphasize, is don't rely on my, us. Don't rely on us. Don't, don't keep coming after us to give you these messages. You work on your connection. Ask God to guide you. They didn't want to become crutches for people. And they always emphasize that. In fact, they would always say to people, after a while of attending this church, we don't want you to come to this service where they would give these messages. They want you to go to the other one where they didn't give messages and you have to do your own spiritual work. So they really trained you to be active. They really trained you to be um, moving in your own path instead of relying on other people, which I thought was a great message. But nonetheless, one of the things that this particular reverend had that I valued so much is he would always take whatever um, scripture he was reading and he would look at the depth of the meaning and he would look at how to apply it in your life. So he had this kind of uh, outline form of his lectures. Here's the information, here's the story, here's the meaning, and here's how you use it in your life. One, two, three. And that's just totally what I was looking for. Give me something that I can use. Give me something that's going to help me make some progress in my life. And, and that's the way I think and that's the way I approach the work I do um, as a speaker in Islamic environments today. I want to make it meaningful, I want to make it relevant, and I want to make it doable for whomever is uh, in my audience. So these were great, great teachers, great lessons that I learned that really moved me um, along my path. Interestingly, as a side note, I was vegetarian for many years as well prior to becoming Muslim. And in a way, I feel like being vegetarian, I purified myself from the haram you know, and I was really, really preparing myself um, to become a Muslim. Because I had been raised overseas and I had been raised often by interacting with a lot of adults, I was much more serious and mature than my peers. Um, so I wasn't interested in the same things they were. I never, I never found myself attracted to alcohol. I never found myself attracted to parties. Um, again, because my parents are my main role model, they weren't like that themselves. This is not the lifestyle they lived. They were decent people down to earth. You know, people have given my parents gifts of alcohol over the years and they're still sitting, it's still sitting in a cabinet untouched for like, I don't know, 40 years. I mean, it's, it's never been used. So 30 years, literally. Um, so this is my role model. These, that was my template, if you will, of, of uh, how to be. And I just was much more serious than my peers, you know. I really, I took my classes and my studies very seriously. In fact, it's so funny, I didn't realize this, but again, this will reveal how serious of a student I was, but I didn't realize that when you were assigned reading in college, that you didn't actually necessarily have to read every single page that was assigned, but I did. So, I was a pretty serious student. Like I read everything that was ever assigned to me except one book one time that I felt so guilty about. So I was very serious in terms of my work and my study and, and I guess that's how I am in general. So when I go to Islamic lectures or I go to events where I'm learning information, when it's told to me, I always feel this impetus to put it into action and to implement it in my life. Um, and so because of this, distractions weren't a big deal for me. I mean, I did listen to music as a child and because of, I lived again in Europe and this was very common. I listened to music. It probably took up a lot of time for me and I guess as an only child it was kind of a friend. It was a companion. It was a fantasy world. You can imagine, you know, your life, um, you know, in those different areas and, and so on. So, yeah, and, and then it was Later on in college, I met my husband, and when I met him, he was it, and, and, and we were committed to one another from the beginning. And so I was very young when I met him, and, um, and we decided that we were the ones for each other. 
And then when we got married, obviously, you know, our life has continued to progress forward. But it's never been, I've never been interested in wasting my time. You know, the number one question converts or reverts, whatever you'd like to call them, get asked is, did you become Muslim because of your husband? Which I find the most ludicrous question to be asked because it implies that you don't have a mind of your own or that you can't make your own choices and everybody knows that the women rule the house. So anyway, how could that be possible? So, I, it's not true, but I would say definitely that it's because of my husband that the doors were opened for me to Islam because from him we, I, I began to learn about Islam. I began to learn about the Ahl al-Bayt. I began to meet Muslims. I began to find out that all my misconceptions, my biases, were not correct. And every person I met impressed me. Every conversation I had about Islam uh, made sense to me. So really one of the first questions we ever had was basically again on the nature of Jesus, on the nature of his mother, who they were, how they're revered. And I was impressed. I said, I didn't know that Islam revered uh, Maryam salam at the time. Because of course, as you remember from the beginning of my story, Maryam salam is the one who began my spiritual journey. It's her presence and her message to humanity that started me looking towards God and trying to find a way to connect and become closer to God and please God. My first conversation about Islam with my husband um, centered around the role or the position of Jesus or Isa salam, and his mother Maryam salam. and I didn't realize that Islam honored her and revered her and because she was the impetus for my journey, my spiritual journey, I was really impressed that Islam uh, talked about her and, and revered her as well because I definitely valued her. You know, I was very much interested in the spiritual world as I've mentioned now but I also have had many experiences where the spiritual world has touched my life and this was one of them having that introduction to um, to my spiritual journey through Mary Marisa and also we have a tradition in uh, the Catholic faith of what are called novenas and these are prayers that are done on a regular basis with a with an intention or a niya to get a certain result or to have a certain request answered. So it's like a dua. And I actually, prior to becoming Muslim, had done one of these novenas for the sake of the Palestinians. So I was very much interested in the Palestinian cause and the rights of uh, the Palestinian people and the oppression that they're facing. So this is part of my makeup as well, which I think, if we fast forward, definitely fits with the story of the Ahl al-Bayt and, and understanding the oppressed and understanding the needs of the oppressed as well as understanding the role of the Ahlul Bayt as being the ones who are mazlum or oppressed. So I have a, I'm drawn to that. It's a natural affinity. It makes sense to me. And in terms of the development of my religion, now I can definitely say that it, you know, it has its roots in my, my justice-minded um, mentality or spirit as a young person. And now to understand the role and the life of the Ahlul Bayt and, and how they were oppressed, as well as what they teach others to do on behalf of humanity. So it, it matches for me. But a long time ago I did a novena and what I had requested was, you know, for the blessings and benefit of the Palestinian people and so forth. And at the end of this particular novena, it is said that St. Therese will give you a flower or a rose because she was called the little flower. And, you know, I finished my novena, I was a college student at the time, and I was walking through the parking lot. And I looked down and there was a rose in the middle of the car park and my prayer had been answered and I picked it up. So early on my experience of seeking the spiritual I always found that it responded to me as well and so Alhamdulillah this is something that has continued in my life but that's definitely part of my early experience and so during those college years I was introduced to my husband again and many other Muslims and each time I would meet them I would be impressed with their character I would be impressed with their intellect and I would be impressed with what they had to share with me. Um, and so each time, you know, I, I grew closer and closer to Islam. So I would say my husband opened a door for me, made opportunities available for me, and helped me on my path by being a great companion. Um, so early on we also visited uh, one of our centers in Washington DC area and there was a conference uh, about uh, Imam Zaman. And again, I enjoyed everything I learned. It impressed me that there was this idea of a Messiah, someone to come to bring justice, to bring peace, to help set humanity on the right path. That just resonated to me as a truth and I accepted it. And 
although now it's many, many years since that conference, I can't remember all the details, but I remember enjoying all the lectures, listening to them and being impressed by it. And at that particular time, the center that I visited was very diverse. There were people of every color, every nationality, different languages, and they were all there as Muslims together learning um, about uh, Imam Zaman and his arrival, inshallah. We began to visit the local mosque at my request. And I said, let's go see if there's an English program. Because most of the programs were in Farsi, but there was one in particular that was conducted in English, and it was a tafsir program every Friday night. And I said, oh, I'd like to go hear what they have to say. I was really curious. And I had gotten over my fear of going to the mosque, but because the first time I went, I was really anxious. I was wearing a scarf. I hadn't uh, you know, put on a manto. And I went in, and I felt you know, a little anxious, but I survived it. You have to remember, too, that because I came from uh, a family who was in the Foreign Service, obviously politics was discussed, ideas were discussed, and I grew up uh, as a young person through the Iranian Revolution. So when I was young, there were, um, there were uh, bumper stickers that were saying negative things about Ayatollah Khomeini. Uh, there was one in particular, I remember someone saying, uh, oh, look at that, it says Ayatollah, and then a bad word afterwards that rhymed with it, and I just felt bad. I was only 10 years old at the time, but when I heard that, it struck me as, that's just not right, that's just not right. I just knew in my heart something wasn't true. And um, I'll tell you later about my experience when I actually visited his house. But nonetheless, that's part of you know, a little experience in my life. Um, so when I did actually visit the mosque, the Iranian mosque, I, I was anxious because of what I had come from, because of this political environment that I grew up in and because of the type of rhetoric around me. But again, my fears were allayed. I came in, people were nice, they greeted us, they were warm, welcoming. You know, we had a good experience. And again, the content of what I learned really impressed me because I'm not just there to join somebody or be a companion to somebody there. I was there because I really want to know what is this all about? What does this religion teach? So it was more curiosity at that point because I really didn't have the intention to change my religion. In fact, I, I, as I mentioned before, this uh, metaphysical chapel that I had attended, it really satisfied me in many ways. I felt that I was comfortable. I felt I was getting what I needed spiritually. I was moving along my path. And I even remember saying to my husband, you know, I like your you know, beliefs and I've enjoyed listening to things, and, but I'm satisfied with what I have. Okay, he was fine. He said, all right, sure, no problem. So off we went to this tefsir and we sit down. And now the interesting thing is the teacher there has a background in the metaphysics and in these New Age books that I had read. He had read all about these past life books. Uh, he had read about near-death experiences. He had read about people who were uh, you know, doing meditation, all these kinds of things. He actually knew these. Uh, it was, he was well-versed in it. And SubhanAllah, the interesting thing is, here I come, this is American girl, young girl, and then you've got all these other people from different um, walks of life, different countries, and they're listening to this man and they're not getting a thing he's saying because it's so foreign to them. You know, the idea that the spiritual world is a reality or, or that the spiritual world can connect with you or, or that people have these experiences where uh, they die and come back and they've got, rev you, know, I, you know, messages and so on. You know, everybody was just like, oh, this guy's crazy. But I'm sitting in there and thinking, wow, he knows what I know. How does this guy know what I know? You know? And I always joke and I say, if I had been sitting on a chair, I would have fallen off my chair when he started mentioning all of these books. And, um, but we weren't sitting on a chair, we were sitting on the floor, traditional style. Um, and I was just incredibly impressed that he spoke my language. Now this is the word I use a lot, and, uh, or this phrase. Allah gave me an opportunity where someone spoke my language. He knew what I knew, and it was this bridge for me. I was like, it was laid out, perfectly constructed. SubhanAllah. And there I was, and I'm listening to him. Now, what did he bring to me beyond what I already knew? He bring a tafsir to me of the Qur'an. He bring the root words. He bring the depth. And remember what I said before about what I liked from that reverend? What would he always do? He would go to the roots. He would go to the depth of the meaning of whatever verse uh, that he read from scriptures. And this is what this teacher did as well. And so it was rich. You could visualize, you could picture what this religion was about. For example, Salah comes from the root word wasale, and that means to connect. Connect. Now you can have a picture of that. Doing Salah, 
is about connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? It's your recharging. It's your regenerating. It's what you need as a human being to keep going. I was on board. I was like, yeah, that's fantastic. I like that. What else would he talk about? He would talk about how zakah, everybody calls it charity, right? Giving money. But that's just one level of it. Zakah is about purification. Purification of what? The nafs. What's the nafs? The nafs is this breath of life. Nafs actually is, even in Hebrew, nafs. It has to do with breath. So it's like the spirit that Allah has put in you that, it, that gives you life. It's part of it. Of course, there's the ruh too, right? That thing that animates everything. And so he would talk about these elements of your spiritual self. He would talk about the depth of the meaning. And it was, again, everything that I was looking for. Tell me about God. Tell me about the spiritual world. How can I make this a reality in my life? And it was, it was just wonderful. So I was enjoying this. I would keep this poor teacher, mashallah, there till midnight every Friday. And I didn't even know that the class actually ended at 10. So I kept the poor man there. But he was so kind, he would always stay. I would even follow him into the parking lot and ask questions. Well, what about women in Islam? What about the hijab? What about this? What about that? And he would always answer it. And every time I'm satisfied, right? I never had any issues with uh, the role of men and women in Islam because of the way he explained it. You know, we have differences, but we each have duties and responsibilities. And of course, you go to uh, Surah Tawbah, and he would talk about, you know, how uh, in Ayah 71 and 72, it talks about the believing men and the believing women. What are their characteristics? The one who makes salah, the one who makes zakah, the one who do good deeds, the one who um, move away from the harm or haram and the evil. And these are the ones who will be granted paradise, both the man, both women. So these are those, those ayahs really impress me because they're always pairing the men and women. Men and women, the believing men, the believing women, the believing men, the believing women. This is their character. This is what they're like. And these are the rewards that they'll receive. But again... I'm not interested in rewards. I don't, I don't need a mansion in paradise. I wanted to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was my drive. And we know that there's a saying from Imam Ali alayhi salam that talks about there's the, the, um, the type of worshiper who is a trader, meaning one who trades in business and they want a result for their action. And then there's those who worship for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who want to seek proximity to Him. So I, um, I think, I hope, inshallah, that I'm one of those. But those were the things that really interested me. And again, I wasn't ready to commit. I was like, I'm almost there. You know, I was beginning to do Salah, you know, little by little. I had some fears about how am I going to leave, uh, you know, the lifestyle I've been used to. How am I going to leave my family? How are they going to handle this? How, what's going to happen with friends? Um, but SubhanAllah, Allah always provides. Always provides. I met some of the best Muslims in my life at this time. They were, uh, we had an excellent Muslim student organization at the school I was at for my master's program, which is George Mason University. The MSA was excellent. It always had activities. It had iftars. The lectures were well done. The events were well done. Um, and I was constantly learning. You know, Allah just continued to put stones like in my path, or you could say stepping stones. Imagine you're on a river and you don't know how to get to the other side. At each moment that you're wondering, am I going to move forward, Allah just raises this stepping stone out of the water, and you're that much closer to the other side. So at the time, you know, there I was on the fence. Am I going to do this? Am I not going to do this? What's the impact, right? How are my parents going to take this? So we went to Tafsir again one night. We're sitting. We, we always would do a little bit of a dhikr before we read Quran, because our teacher would say, if you want to get closer to Allah, then you really got to bring this intention deeply within yourself. You've got to um, purify yourself by always doing dhikr. And he would say, dhikr is the thing that will cure the heart. And only the hearts that remember Allah will be tranquil. So it's always related to, the, he always did that with the tafsir. And he also believed and taught us that by doing this dhikr, the, the language of the Quran and the verses will be more clear to you because you've now really dedicated yourself to understanding. And so we would sit and we would do the dhikr, and one of the dhikrs we would do would be Allah, Allah, Allah. And so one night he says, even your heart says Allah. He's a medical doctor. He says, if you listen with the stethoscope to the heart, it says Allah, Allah, Allah. That was it. I had to submit. There was no doubt. There was certainty. And that was it. You know, your own heart in your own body is saying, Allah, 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 then why doesn't your mind say it? Why don't your own lips say it? That was it. I committed. I said my shahada. And, and that was in October of 1994. I accepted Islam. Alhamdulillah.
alhamdulillah. And that was just the beginning though. Because one thing I learned is that Muslim, or any word in Arabic that has the muh prefix, means you're the doer of that uh, verb, right, or that word. So you are the doer of Islam, or the doer of submission. If you're a mu'min, you are the one who does, you know, the beliefs, practices the beliefs. So I learned from the very beginning that Islam is an active religion. It is not a passive one. It's not one where you just say, okay, I know what I know, alhamdulillah, I'm finished. I don't need to learn anything else. That was stage one. I call it my Mecca period because that was the period where I fell in love with Allah. I fell in love with Allah and His beloved and his beloved ones, I should say. And so the, that's the period where I understood the idea of taqwa, where I understood the ideas of tawheed, where I understood, you know, basics of ibadah, and the meaning behind all of the ibadah, right? The fact that uh, even abd means you are the slave, you are the worshiper, you are the one who submits, you know. And every time I learn something, I want to know that richness, I want to see that picture. And so that's how, how I would approach everything um, that, I, that I learned. In this Mecca period, if you will, of where I'm understanding the basic big ideas of Islam and understanding um, ibadah, worship, um, and I'm beginning to implement all my acts of worship, um, I had, there came a time where I had to tell my family that I have chosen this religion. It took me a while to gain the courage to tell them yeah, it sure did. And I, I told them, and my mother was not so happy, and my father was not so thrilled, but he was a little more, you know, easygoing in terms of saying, well, okay, it's, it's your choice. Because, again, he came from kind of an agnostic background. He didn't have a real strong commitment to any particular faith. My mom, it took her a while to accept uh, that I had chosen this path that was different than her vision for me, which any parent has a vision for their child and they want them to have what they believe is the best. And of course she grew, uh, she didn't grow up, but she lived in Lebanon and so she had seen some stereotypical Arab behavior and she was worried about this kind of thing. She didn't want me to have to experience any of that um, sometimes uh, experienced oppression of women or uh, you know, where women are not given full opportunities because, of course, I'm her only child. She'd raised me to be, you know, an achiever. She wanted me to do well in college. She wanted me to do well in my career and so on. And she didn't want that to be diverted. So in her mind, she was worried that these things might happen. Of course, alhamdulillah, they didn't. I'm continuing to be a student even to this day and I've progressed in my uh, field and in my work. So it took her more time. But the icebreaker for her, of course, was when our first daughter was born after our wedding, you know, after our marriage. And uh, in 97, um, my first daughter was born, and grandmas don't want to miss their grandchildren. So that was, again, that was the bridge that, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, brought her back into our life full time. And, uh, and my father was always there for us throughout the experience, and it was a little more patient. Even though at that time, in the beginning, when I chose to wear hijab, he didn't like that either. So even though he was pretty flexible in most respects, the hijab bothered him. He really didn't want that to happen. But subhanAllah, one thing I've learned as being a Muslim, and, and this is why I like to talk about the story of, of conversion or reversion, is because it, it changes, it grows, you learn. You know, you never stop learning and you never stop becoming more and more committed to Islam. You, you have to keep going. And one of the lessons has been sabr, patience through difficulty. So in the beginning it was difficult, but here we are, 14 years later, my, both of my parents said to me just this past year, Nicole, we are so happy that your girls wear hijab. Allahu Akbar. I mean, Allahu Akbar. Wow. Again, it was another opportunity to say, oh my gosh, I'm going to fall off my chair. What did you say? You know, it was amazing. I was just thrilled. But they say, we see how decent they are. We see how different they are than the other average kids. They're not interested in foolishness like I was, and you know I wasn't either when I was a young person. And you know they they they've become really good little Muslims. They are committed to Islam. They they all wear hijab now. My nine-year-old just had her jashn ibadat, which is like the, what we say in uh, in the Iranian tradition of uh, celebrating her accepting uh, Islam. 
So it was kind of, we had a special ceremony. And I did a ceremony for each of the girls so that <clears throat> we really acknowledge that we take seriously that you've committed to Islam too, and that this is a journey and it's a path. And so the ceremony that I created for them was one of, <clears throat> I gave them gifts. And I said, these are your gifts along your journey. I gave them Islamic clothes as gifts. I gave them a Quran as their guide. I gave them water as a symbolic, you know, sustenance from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And then we had each of their aunties from my, you know, friends of mine from the community, give them a rose as a symbol of their beauty, and uh, give them a gift that had some symbolic meaning and some words of advice. <coughs> Excuse me. So we did this for the girls too. Alhamdulillah. So there's a picture for me of Sabah, right? The beginning is a wall. and the end, there's no wall. There was a bridge and a love and an acceptance and an opportunity. And that's a wonderful lesson, I think, for many converts or reverts to understand that things take time. And don't judge anything right now because it's not finished yet. You know, it's just the beginning. It takes time for people to let go of their beliefs or to let go of their fears. and to see that things are going to go in a good direction for you as a Muslim, inshallah. So that was, that was my experience with my parents. So early on, the other issue was hijab. I have accepted Islam. Now, am I going to do all of the, of the requirements? And I take things seriously in general. So I'm a pretty serious person. So I said, okay, this religion is not what I call cafeteria style. I don't take my tray, walk down the line and say, I'll pick this. and that, but not that, and I'll leave that one out too, no. You know, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it right, you're going to do it the whole way, 100%. So I said, I'm ready to submit. And I accepted wearing hijab, and uh, I did that about a year after I had become Muslim. So that was, that was a big transition at the time. And that, even through all of the uh, turbulent political climate we've had since 2000, uh, 2001, Alhamdulillah, Allah has preserved our experience, has given us peace and not allowed us to be targeted in any negative way, Alhamdulillah, because of our hijab or because of being Muslim. So we're very grateful to Allah for keeping us safe. The mosque that I attended uh, ha was a Shia mosque. And the tafsir class was also conducted by a Shia uh, Muslim from Karbala, incidentally. And so the discussion of the Imams and the Ahl al-Bayt were, were always in the theme of the tafsir as well. They were always referenced. So I was very familiar with their names, I was very familiar with some of their stories. But in the beginning, because the particular group that I was around were the type of people who said, let's just call ourselves Muslim, and this is how we're going to identify ourselves, this is how I was encouraged to think. And I think as a beginning Muslim, as someone, as a revert, you're taking on a lot, yeah? So this was a good period of just kind of getting, again, the big ideas, getting settled with this identity, and taking it step by step. But the stories and the names of the Ahl Bay were constantly with me from the very beginning. But one of the biggest things that impressed me that the path of the Ahl Bay was the right path, the righteous path, are, is the simplest story. And in fact, always the simplest things sometimes make the most sense. There's something in, uh, in the sciences called Occam's razor, and it says the simplest solution is usually the right one. So I had heard that when the Prophet ﷺ died, that the person who washed his body was Ali ﷺ. And that impressed me. And that should speak volumes to anybody, because Would you ever consider leaving any of your loved ones alone? Walk away from them and go to a meeting? Would you ever even imagine having such heartlessness? Would you ever do such a thing? I mean, no one would do that. I don't think you could find hardly anyone, unless you find some of the most vicious criminals, which are an exception altogether, or a psychopath. But your normal human beings, would they ever leave a beloved person, walk away and go and have a meeting or do some other activity? Not a chance. So immediately right there you're seeing righteousness, you're seeing decency, you're seeing humanity, you're seeing care and sensitivity. And that is one of the first indications to me that Ali 
is a rightful Imam and that his path and following him is the right way to go. Since that first introduction, I have studied many other things. I've read the books of Tijani and then I was guided, which gave me plenty of information that, again, corroborated this simple yet poignant example of who is the righteous leader. And I read um, that extensively and highlighted everything. So what also strikes me, too, is that the Prophet's last uh, the sermon, the sermon he gave at Qadir al-Khum, that's something I've studied more recently. But it, if you read it out loud, it's two and a half hours long. And we consider it a valid source. But not only that, what's fascinating when you actually do read it is how much he repeats over and over that this is my wasi, this is my successor. All who want to follow the right path should, should follow him. And he lifts his hand and he says this over and over. Now, I'm a parent, I'm a teacher. I know that when you really emphasize something to a simpler, younger child, you say it repetitively. This speech repeats it and repeats it. And in fact, it was interesting, we were off to uh, a speaking engagement that I do now uh, at the Imam Ali Center in our area on behalf, you know, at the time of the Qadir home, uh, home celebration. And uh, my daughter was reading it to me. The, the speech. And she stops reading it after a few minutes and says to me, Mommy, is he talking to a group of children? Because he's repeating this over and over. The Prophet is repeating this over and over to make it emph emphatic that this is your leader, this is your guide, this is your wasi. And another interesting thing that I just learned, which is, you know, subhanAllah, there's the, the hadith from the Prophet that says, Ali is to me as Harun was to Moses or Musa. Now, if you go to the Qur'an and you read in Surah Shu'ara, you see very clearly that Allah says, I sent you both. He says, I send you both, Harun and Musa. It, it clearly says it, right in the beginning of that, that uh, Surah, that He is sending both. What? Meaning the legitimacy is not just from the Prophet, it's also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Ali and the Imams are appointed by Allah through the Prophet and then through the Imams legitimately. And there's another proof. So we could go on, I mean, alhamdulillah, there are so many other indications and they're always, always coming at you. The fact that he chose him as his brother when the, the Muhajireen and the Ansar came together. He chose him, you know, and all, and then it was, it was Imam Ali alayhi salam who laid in the bed uh, when the Prophet had to leave Mecca so that he wasn't killed. I mean, we could go on and on and on. I mean, you know, it, it's like, if you look today, in today's world, we'd say it, there's neon lights flashing, blinking, arrows pointing, hello, hello, you know, wake up people, this is, this is the rightly guided one, this one, yeah, alhamdulillah. And, um, you know, so that is definitely something that I, can, I, I was clear about from the simplest point, and now, alhamdulillah, I have more evidence for here at this point in my life. I mentioned that in the beginning of being a Muslim, I went through what I call my Mecca period, getting the big ideas. And now I'm in my Medina period, getting more details, learning more fiqh, learning more uh, details of the seerah of the Prophet, the life of the Imams, learning the history, learning hadith. These are the things that I'm most interested in right now in my life, and really understanding the history from the, the Ahl al-Bayt point of view, or from the Jafari point of view. What is it that took place? I want to know these things. I want them to be at my fingertips. And it's, it's hard, but I struggle, and I keep trying. Another thing I've taken on now in this Medina period, if you will, is studying Arabic, which I wish I had had the opportunity as a new Muslim to invest in earlier. But unfortunately, resources and teachers and programs were not available for me at the time, which is a pity. In fact, one of the things I would say to our listeners and to the people watching is that how important it is to support your converts, to support your young people in the community, to get a good, healthy foundation in Islamic knowledge, in Arabic, and to have it be meaningful and relevant to them. Uh, so this is the period I'm in right now. I could say, as what has Islam done for me? I've definitely become a better person in many ways. One is understanding patience. One is understanding humility. One is understanding how to really examine the self and the soul and really stand in 
all that you need to stand in to really examine yourself and really change, that's not easy. It's painful. Nobody likes to see their flaws. But I really try to work hard at being honest with myself and just cleansing the heart, cleansing the illusions in my mind, because we all live with illusions and we all live with fears. And we have to just release those so that we can see that the abundance of Allah is ever-present. You know, Shaitan, how did he trick Adam and Eve? He said, come here, let me give you something because you need this. When in fact they had everything they needed already around them and perfection. But he says, no, 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 there's more. You need this, you need this. And so he makes you feel insecure. He makes you feel that you're lacking when in fact you're already in the oneness of Allah. You're already in that peace and tranquility and the abundance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter what. In fact, people in the hardest circumstances can be the, some of the most beautiful, healthy people. I recently had a chance to meet Lauren Booth, and one of the interesting things I learned from her was on one of her visits to Palestine, she met a woman who lived in a very simple concrete structure, and the woman barely had anything uh, in her home at all. And I believe it was at the time of Ramadan, nonetheless, Lauren came in and says to her, I don't understand why you're fasting. How could you be fasting? What is this religion of yours? This was before she was Muslim. What is this religion of yours that's making you fast? You live in such a difficult circumstance. How, how could this be right? And the woman said to her, oh, sister, we fast to remember the poor. You, know, you could cry. You could cry for that because, you know, that's what Islam teaches you, that there's there's abundance, there's an answer, and that Allah is with you, and He's with those who are oppressed, He's with those who are suffering. And, and this is what, you know, you have the blessing to feel and experience and know firsthand as a Muslim. And it's a journey that doesn't end, because SubhanAllah, when you get to one level, you open a door, and there's a horizon out there, and a, and a, and a landscape that's extensive and far, and you think, wow, there's so much more to go, it's because Allah is never ending in his abundance, his mercy, his, his knowledge, his gifts to us. So there's always more to learn and inshallah as a Muslim, you know, I've learned that this is something that we keep doing, we keep moving towards. And alhamdulillah, over the years I've had my family and I've dedicated my life to raising my children and taking care of my husband and our home and creating a sanctuary, if you will, um, a repose for us. And I homeschool my girls, so I'm 100% with these girls. I take care of them from, you know, the morning to the, to the night. And, um, you know, it takes a lot out of someone to be, what we say, on all the time. Like, I don't get a coffee break. I don't get a little, you know, afternoon uh, relaxation period. I'm always working for them. But I love it. I love to learn and I love to teach them. I've done training in what we call Waldorf education. And that's the type of educational system I use in my homeschooling work. And one other thing that I've done all throughout their lives and even before they were born was work in my local Islamic community by volunteering, working with the youth. And over time, I, I worked as um, the youth coordinator. Um, I was on the board of the mosque for a short period of time. I've worked to try to assist the Muslim community school that we had in our area to develop its teacher training and to, to implement um, some new ideas. So I'm always working to try to help improve the situation of the Muslims, help, in, help the youth in particular, because I've always seen how they get ignored. And as a convert and as a youth, you know, we have a similar experience, right? We need someone to give us information, to give us guidance, to give us support. And I saw that even the simplest thing was missing, like saying salam to them in the mosque. So that's how I started, by saying salam to the youth, taking time to talk to them, get to know them. And from that, I started to develop uh, my speaking skills, and I would do presentations, I would do lectures, and now, alhamdulillah, I've had the opportunity to travel to give talks in, uh, in Canada and uh, here in the UK as well. I want to begin by referring to a hadith of, uh, from Imam Mahdi himself, alayhi salam. Muhammad wa Muhammad. As for deriving benefit from me in my occultation is like deriving benefit from the sun when it hides behind the clouds. I bring this forward again because what I emphasized the other day was in the importance of remembering the unseen. It's a foundational belief in the ghaib. It's part of our deen. It, is, it was emphasized in Surah Baqarah, as I mentioned to you yesterday. And I think again when we look at this notion that there is an individual who is not visible to us yet is important and is 
present and significantly affects our lives as uh, Muslimin Mumineen. And so what's important to remember is this is something that must be at the front of your mind to increase your faith in this understanding, to increase your faith and understanding of the unseen. That's my first advice to you in our preparation. So no matter what your schedule is, what your daily activities are like, take the time to remind yourself about this, to remove yourself from expecting material evidence and to be opening your heart and your mind to the reality of Allah.